Welcome back guys to my countdown of my top 100 films of the decade. This video I'm going to be looking at the films that place between positions 80 and 71. Let's get started. Right, at number 80 we have a film that proves that not only do the Germans possess a sense of humour, but they can have you on the floor rolling in hysterics, and it is Marin Ada's Tony Erdmann. Oh, the joy I had watching this film. Tony Erdmann tells the story of a German father called Winfried, who's played in this film by Peter Simonischek, who visits his workaholic daughter, Inez, who's played by Sandra Hewler, in order to reconnect. But after seeing how her corporate job has made his daughter cold and impersonable, Winfried assumes a character in order to get through to her using the power of laughter. This character, which he calls Tony Erdmann, is a life coach and he puts on a pair of fake Austin Powers teeth and a rock star wig and starts showing up at all of Inez's work events and meetings trying to make her laugh and see the joy of life. But of course to Inez all she sees is an intrusive overbearing father who's being completely inappropriate and causing chaos at her work. This film had me bawling both with laughter and tears it's such a delightfully heartfelt film about an estranged father-daughter relationship, but it's so wonderfully funny and relatable. Both the leads are incredible. Peter Simonischek is off the charts funny. He's the inappropriate dad who thinks he's funny, but no one's really laughing. But his heart's in the right place, and you just love him for going to these levels to get through to his daughter. And Sandra Hewlett is a terrific straight woman for Winfried or Tony Erdman to bounce off of. But they also have some truly touching scenes together, which had me weeping. Plus, it's also got arguably the best and funniest scene with nudity in of the last decade. This is the type of comedic film which is painfully funny to watch. It's so cringe, but in the best possible way. It is a fine art marrying together farce and seriousness, and Marin Ada's bittersweet comedy is a treasure because it gets the balance just right. Right, so next up we have a film that angered, shocked, and floored me and it's Tom McCarthy's Spotlight. Spotlight tells the true life story of a team of journalists from the Boston Globe newspaper who discovered the Catholic Church had covered up a web of child molestations from a distressingly high number of its priests. I was so engaged watching this film. What's remarkable about Spotlight is that it's not a flashy film, it's not particularly exciting, but it's so riveting in the way that it builds. There's nothing glamorous about what we watch. The entire film is a series of scenes following these journalists doing their jobs having meetings, making phone calls, skimming through files in fluorescent offices, following up on leads, and eventually meeting witnesses who reveal their truth. And these discoveries of what these journalists find feel like our discoveries. It's so grounded in reality, this film. The performances are impressively restrained. It's a film which doesn't feel the need to shout in order to get its message across. Because A, that's not how people operate in the real world, and B, the audience feels the weight and the impact of the developments of the story as it unfolds. The power of Spotlight is how it manages to shake you to your foundations, but in the quietest way possible. Spotlight is a sublime film and a very much deserved Best Picture recipient. All right, so next up on the list is the closing chapter of Christopher Nolan's The Dark Knight trilogy. It is, of course, The Dark Knight Rises. And Gotham is in ashes. Then you have my permission to die. Oh, what a lovely voice. Following in the footsteps of arguably the greatest superhero film of all time, The Dark Knight, it was never going to be an easy feat for Christopher Nolan to satisfy the masses. But like the title of this film suggests, Christopher Nolan rises to the challenge with immense virtuosity. Picking up eight years after where The Dark Knight left us, Batman has taken the fall for Harvey Dent and has ushered in a new wave of peace and hope in Gotham City. However, tyrannical juggernaut villain Bane rises to power and plans to redistribute that power to the citizens of Gotham by revealing that Batman and Commissioner Gordon lied about Harvey Dent's murders. The peace of Gotham was founded on lies, so Bruce Wayne must learn to become the Batman once again in order to save Gotham from itself. From the jaw-dropping opening, Bane hijacks the plane sequence with so much of it done practically instead of CGI to the film's open-ended resolution, The Dark Knight Rises is an action-packed, intelligent conclusion to Christopher Nolan's gritty trilogy of the Caped Crusader. So yeah, The Dark Knight Rises is spectacular. Okay, so at number 77, we have another film from one of the greatest filmmakers of the decade, Denis Villeneuve, and it is Blade Runner 2049. I'm gonna be honest with you guys, when I started writing my top 100 countdown list, I hadn't actually seen Blade Runner 2049. It was a film that always slipped through the cracks to me, probably because I wasn't even that big of a fan of the original Blade Runner, and I meant to watch it, but I just never got around to it. But there was this voice in the back of my head that said to me, you should probably watch Blade Runner 2049. Like, there's a lot of love for this film, and what if you 
do love it and you don't put it on the list. So I listened to that nagging voice in the back of my head and I finally got around to watching it a few weeks ago and oh my god, I'm so glad I listened to that voice because this film is masterful. I mean, to make a sequel to one of the most influential and important sci-fi films ever made is ballsy, but Denis Villeneuve has made the perfect follow-up which builds on the work of Philip K. Dick but thankfully also doesn't feel like it's setting up a cinematic universe with sequels to follow. This film is a standalone film in itself, which posits some fascinating questions about replicants and what it means to be human. Ryan Gosling plays a cop K who is a replicant and also a Blade Runner who is hunting his own kind. He makes a startling discovery about replicants and must find Rick Deckard, who's once again played by Harrison Ford, to uncover the truth. Every single frame of this film is immaculate. Cinematographer Roger Deakins finally got his long overdue Oscar for his work. I mean, look at it. It's stunning. It's also a film that not only respects Ridley Scott's original, but also respects the audience enough to follow it and understand it. It doesn't talk down to this film. It's intellectual, it's moody, it's bold. Honestly, I didn't think I was gonna enjoy this film, but Denis Villeneuve has managed to find a way to put his own stamp on the Blade World universe whilst respecting the original and also not dumbing it down or making it action packed in order for a modern audience to find it accessible. This is an artistic film with a blockbuster budget and it's guided by a director who has vision and integrity. He's one of the best auteurs we have working today. Honestly, we are lucky that this film got made. All right, so next up on the list is a genre blender unlike any other, part car chase, part romance, part musical in a sense. And it's Edgar Wright's high octane Baby Driver. Pardon the pun, but this film is an absolute joyride. Ansel Ilgott plays Baby, the best getaway driver in the business, but he keeps having to work one more job, one more heist for his boss Doc, who's played by Kevin Spacey, in order to settle his debt. He falls for a waitress called Deborah, who's played by Lily James, but when a job goes awry, he gets both himself and Deborah into a dangerous situation with some vengeful criminals. Edgar Wright has yet to disappoint me with any of his films. All of his movies are such a blast. Baby Driver has that classic boy meets girl romance, as well as the thrills of a heist movie, and the choreography of a musical in the way that its action set pieces are executed. It's supremely stylish and the soundtrack and the editing are a match made in heaven. Each song was carefully selected by Wright to build a car chase scene around. Everything just clicks into place. I'm not even a big car film fan, but Baby Driver is vibrant, sharply written, toe-tapping, exhilarating, and immensely rewatchable. Baby Driver is the reason that we go to the cinema. Okay, so we're a quarter of the way through the list. How are you guys feeling? Enjoying yourselves? Shall we continue? All right, so next up on the list at number 75 is a film where everyone collectively agrees the tagline of this film should have been the title of the film. I still think it's called Live, Die, Repeat, but it's actually called Edge of Tomorrow. Directed by Doug Lyman, Edge of Tomorrow is like a mashup of Groundhog Day and a video game. Tom Cruise plays Major William Cage, a smarmy, cowardly military PR rep who is thrown into the front lines of a battle with some tentacled aliens which are called Mimics, who have invaded most of Europe. Given a lack of military training, it's no surprise that Cage is almost immediately killed in battle, but at the moment of death, he wakes up again at the start of the very same day in which he is doomed to die. He ends up living and dying the same day over and over and over again. But each day is like practicing a video game level that you're dying to master. He gets a little bit further each time as he learns from his mistakes, and eventually Cage meets another soldier called Rita, who's played by Emily Blunt, who has a similar predicament. Edge of Tomorrow is a bombastic ride of a film. It's actually scenes are very loud, very explosive, and also a bit reminiscent of D-Day. Despite the repetitive nature of its storyline, it does feel like you're constantly progressing with the characters, doing a little better each time. Arguably, Edge of Tomorrow was a sleeper hit because it didn't make that much money at the box office. I didn't go to see this at the cinema, but lots of people were talking about it, so I watched it on Blu-ray like many other people did, and audiences fell in love with it. So much so that a sequel is actually in the works now, and get this, it's actually on IMDb as Live, Die, Repeat, and repeat. <laughs> that is genius. I've already seen how this day plays out a thousand times already, but I would happily pay to see a sequel and see the same day play out a thousand times over again just because it's that good. Right, so next up on the list is the first film from Quentin Tarantino with his love letter to the golden age of Hollywood and classic cinema. It's of course the ludicrously entertaining Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. This film is set loosely around the events of the infamous Manson murders of the 1960s, but Tarantino has taken a few artistic liberties and Reread a bit of history where he can with gleeful wit. You're always guaranteed a good time with a Tarantino film, and his ninth and supposedly penultimate film is no exception. As far as Tarantino movies go, this is one of his more relaxed entries. Dare I say, his most subtle. 
a quality that he is not known for. Yes, there is over-the-top violence, but that mostly comes during the film's brilliant climax. The film follows middle-aged actor Rick Dalton, playing this film by Leonardo DiCaprio, trying to recapture the glory days of his early career to mix results. Fortunately, Rick's level-headed friend and stuntman Cliff Booth, who's playing this film by Brad Pitt, is there to keep him in check whilst he goes through this career crisis. Their friendship is the heart, soul, and funny bone of this film. Leonardo DiCaprio and Brad Pitt are at the top of their game. The film itself is also easy on the eyes. It's beautifully shot with stylish finesse from cinematographer Robert Richardson, lots of overhead crane shots and beautiful long takes. And let's not forget those feet shots, that is quintessential Tarantino. The soundtrack begs to be bought on vinyl, it's vintage but effortlessly cool. Tarantino continues to break the rules when it comes to his films, and while Once Upon a Time in Hollywood might not be his best film, it was still one of the best films to come out of 2019. Now get cracking with Kill Bill 3, a Star Trek movie or a horror movie, whatever you're planning to do as your final film because we're hungry for it, Tarantino. Okay, so next up on the list is an exuberant musical biopic about the musician Elton John. It is, of course, Dexter Fletcher's Rocket Man. I'm not even that big of a fan of Elton John's music, but this film was an absolute treat. Rocket Man almost feels like a film adaptation of a West End musical. Like, the set pieces in this film, you can picture them being done on a stage. Mark my words, Rocket Man will one day be a West End show. The beauty of this musical biopic is that it uses the rich catalogue of Elton's work to make the pivotal moments of his life and career more poignant, and it's executed with flamboyant gravitas. This is what elevates Rocket Man from a typical by-the-numbers biopic to a joyful, surreal fantasy. It's vibrant, it's infectious, at times it's euphoric, but best of all, it's a warts and all film showing us Elton John at his ugliest. Tyron Edgerton gives a career best performance as Elton John. The costumes and the choreography are fabulous. I left this film with the biggest smile on my face because it completely surpassed my expectations. Okay, so next up at number 72 is a film that is so expertly crafted and yet it didn't receive the awards recognition that it rightfully deserved. It's the achingly beautiful film from Barry Jenkins, If Beale Street Could Talk. Beale Street deserves to be discussed more, to be cherished more but it lives in the shadow of his far more successful big brother, Moonlight, which Barry Jenkins took home Best Picture for. But Beale Street is just as tender, intimate, and evocative as Moonlight. Adapted from the novel by James Baldwin, If Beale Street Could Talk is a tragic but hopeful love story about two lovers from 1970s Harlem, New York. They are Tish and Fonny, who are played in this film by Kiki Lane and Stephen James. Fonny is arrested for a crime that he didn't commit, and we watch how the rest of the family deals with the social injustice. This film is like visual poetry. It's so gracefully crafted. Each shot, each frame and composition feels like it's saying something. Jenkins' gentle approach is tactile and gorgeous. The hairs on my arms stood up on end so many times watching Beale Street. That's because of the pristine cinematography by James Laxton and the hauntingly beautiful score by Nicholas Patel. I'm just hoping that if Beale Street could talk is one of those films that gains more appreciation the more time that passes, because it honestly deserves better. Right, so next up at number 71 is a social satire, which manages to be a perfect blend of romance, comedy, drama, and sci-fi. And it is Spike Jonze's Her. Set in the near future, the story of Her sees divorced protagonist Theodore, who's been this film by Joaquin Phoenix, longing for intimacy and connection. He purchases a new operating system to help organize his life. And this OS speaks to Theodore, kind of like Siri, but she's called Samantha, and she's voiced perfectly by the husky Scarlett Johansson. And because Samantha has the capacity to learn from Theodore, she ends up knowing him better than anybody else in his life. So it isn't long before Theodore develops feelings for Samantha and then eventually starts to date her. Her is one of the few films in this top 100 countdown which I can say is a movie of our time right now. Even though it's set in the not too distant future, it really says more about where we're at now. Spike Jones has made a film which is not only a poignant love story, it's also a sharp commentary on social media and dating apps. Her illustrates that even with this huge acceleration of technology that we've seen over the last 10 years, what with smartphones, social media, apps, these things constantly give us instant gratification, but at the end of the day, we're all still lonely individuals. The paradox being that social media has made us more connected, but simultaneously more isolated. This film really spoke to me, mainly because even though it's set in the not too distant future, it doesn't feel that much different from where we're at now. This film is a conceivable idea of what our future could look like. We all long for intimacy, but we're too obsessed with our cyber lives to notice what's going on around us. We see it every day. People just have their faces constantly glued to the screen, looking down into their cyber world, not noticing that the real world's happening around them. And like Theodore in this film, we're looking for intimacy and connection 
fiction in places where it doesn't really exist. Samantha isn't real, she's just a computer program with a lovely voice. But I was still so swept up in the romance between Theodore and Samantha because their connection did feel real. As an audience member, I believed it. And that's why I love this film, because I felt so enveloped in it. I was invested in the characters and the romance, and it's a film which also has so much to say. Anybody from the Western world who has ever dated will see themselves in this film somewhere. It's so universal. There we go, guys. That was my countdown from numbers 80 to 71. Whatever you guys think of the movies I picked for this vid, be sure to let your voice be heard in that comment section down below. If you haven't already, don't forget to click subscribe, and as always, thanks so much for watching. I shall see you guys in the next one.